Chapter 7, Meeting the Savages It is very common in books of exploration in South America to find references to encounters with the reptile called anaconda, boa constrictor or sucuri. Possibly its characteristics have stimulated the imagination of some zoologists and expeditionaries and led them to exaggerate its powers. On the other hand, there are some who, ignoring scientific evidence, have tried to give the impression that the anaconda is inoffensive, and that there is no basis in fact for the reputation it has gained. One thing is certain, those who think in this way can never have confronted the species of Ophidian in the mature state. The measurements of an adult anaconda are generally 13 to 20 feet long, and 10 inches to a foot in diameter. It is a restless and voracious creature except when it is engaged in the slow and laborious process of digestion. Its muscles react rapidly and it possesses enormous crushing power. It is capable of converting the strongest head of cattle into a mangled mass of dead meat. Some experts have told of boa constrictors 52 and a half feet long I myself have seen in captivity in the Utanatun Institute in Sao Paulo a specimen 33 and a half feet long. To the Syrianaro of the Mato Grosso, it is a threat to his domestic economy, as is the jaguar. The anaconda preys upon all his livestock, from hens to oxen which it strangles while the animal is drinking incautiously at the river's edge. It has a special liking for dogs, sucking pigs and calves. To the savant, however, the sucuri constitutes a pleasant delicacy, enabling him to make a welcome change in his diet. As for me, an encounter with one of these reptiles was the last thing I wanted. A sense of self-preservation kept me sensitive to the whole configuration of the riverside, the aspect of the water, and the characteristics of the vegetation. A mere vague glint in the verdant curtain of the forest meant, generally, that some bird was fluttering out of a tree. A twig moving out of rhythm with the rest would indicate some animal lurking there. V-shaped lines in quiet waters told of the proximity of some rodent. We were heading downriver on a further stage of the of our voyage, we no longer rode until just before sundown. Now we sought shelter two hours beforehand to give the Zavants more opportunities for hunting. Something warned me, moving outwards from the river bank, I searched among the branches of the withered trees which the, floor, the flood tide was accumulating. There, where a tree trunk should have been, rigid, there was a swaying motion. At first, I did not realize what was causing the movement. Then, I sat breathless with astonishment. A boa constrictor was coiled around the trunk, and swaying came from the waving of its extraordinarily flat head, which was contemplating us with eyes that seemed inordinately large and inexpressive. Guided by instinct, I fired my revolver twice, endangering the stability of the canoe. The detonations made Urita react with a rapidity and precision, which can only be described as fantastic. The ophidian curled like a broken spiral spring, its vertebral column shattered. At the same moment, the warrior flexed his bow and sent an arrow straight into the bow constrictor's head. The canoe ran aground gently at the riverside. Sare and Urita ran to the spot where the anaconda lay. It hung from the tree trunk with part of its body in the water. At this spot was unsuitable for camping. We went on a little farther, dragging the reptile behind us through the water, tied by a rope. Although I was afraid the piranhas might make short work of a good deal of the anaconda, it arrived intact at the place we chose. It proved to be just over 15 feet long. At the Indian supper was assured and it was still quite early. We took the opportunity of skinning the boa constrictor, intending to save the skin. This turned out to be a revolting job. The Zavant arrow had crushed the reptile's head, 
but its body continued to perform lively contractions. We hung it up and worked on it with a well-sharpened knife. Each time we stretched it, it gave a violent contortion and soiled the Indians with a spurt of blood. They expressed their repugnance aloud when this occurred and promptly rubbed the affected part of their bodies with water and a leaf. The Indians made a pit some 20 inches deep and covered the hole with smooth stones. They tied the reptile in a seemingly endless zigzag and placed it on the stones, putting firewood upon it and setting fire to it. The heat reduced the anaconda to almost half its original length. It looked like an enormous roasted eel. Once cooked, it didn't look so bad. However, my desire to sample it had evaporated during the preparation. Though we were rowing for a large part of each day, when bedtime came, we could not get to sleep. Through a slit in the canvas that sheltered us from the dampness of the night, we could see the stars and the moon. Often big, dense clouds roamed across the sky, but the rainy season had come to an end, and fortunately for our convenience and security, the sun would soon be shining again, bringing it intensely sultry heat. The nights were not so excessively cold as they had been a month before. One month, it seemed like a dream, and owing to the unreality of our lives, we almost believed it was. It was still cold at night, so we had to wrap up well if we wanted to sleep comfortably, but now the blankets did not seem so inadequate at, as at first. It was not uncommon to hear the snoring sound or the dry cough of the jaguar, despite all the tales we had been told and the advice we had been given to camp on sandy islets, to elude these carnivores, we set up our camp wherever we thought we would, generally in the intricate density of the jungle. We never once had occasion to regard this practice as imprudent. The big cats prowled around inquisitively, but never came too close. Oreta and Salre would have their supper and immediately stick their spears in the ground, stretch themselves out, and then a few seconds would be sound asleep. If we got up for any reason, invariably one of the two would open his eyes. The slightest stir of undergrowth, even a freshening of the wind, and a consequent movement of branches would suffice to have the warriors awake and listening intently. There had been times during the day as we were navigating the canoe when the sudden appearance of a deer or a pack of monkeys had caused them to grab their bows even though hunting was out of the question but now they never took up arms on such occasion, and a thing he had never been in the habit of doing, Sal Ray would turn his head every now and then in tacit consultation with Ureta. Although they said nothing to us about it, we knew, and an uncomfortable sensation gripped me. I took off my revolver holster and covered the carbines over with the tarpaulin. <clears throat> we were about to arrive at the place, where the parent tribe went hunting, the feeling of being intruders to the point of sticking our noses where we had not been invited was as strong as or stronger than the sense of danger that lurked around us. If they always killed the civilized man who encroached upon their land, why should we be any exception? We were all anxiously expecting something, the Indians to meet their tribal blood brothers, we a number of things, and none of them pleasant. We were thinking we should see, at every turn of the river, a group of savants ready to receive us in a bellicose manner. The sharp cry of a bird, the leap of a fish, or the snort of a water wolf on the bank had us alert and tense. We had no idea what awaited us or how events would turn out. This not knowing was above everything what made our nerves as taut as the turned strings of a fiddle. The savants had always been very manifestly laconic. That afternoon, their incommunicativeness was positively irritating. The indignation I felt made me, without warning, turn the canoe towards the bank to make camp. Neither of them budged from his seat. They noted my irritation, and Ureta spoke in a tone of voice I had not known before a really friendly one, friendly tone, to tell me. We rock 
to Redi Toa. Hut's near, let's go. I smiled to Norma and she smiled back. We were nervous and anxious, but happy at the same time. All sensation of fear or uneasiness was absorbed in the recognition of our weariness and in the fulfillment of our original plan. I rode with renewed vigor. This caused Ureta to reward me with something that I still and will always appreciate. He turned round and gave me a smile, which was a mixture of approval and friendliness. He realized now for the first time that we were put to the test, that what we had said in the council of his tribe was true. All we wanted was the honor of living for a time among the most valiant and most famous of all the warrior tribes. The riverside cliff was different from all the others. Where there should have been plentiful grass, there was smooth, hard mud, for this was the tribe's access to the river. And there were some dry tree trunks for the greater convenience of the women when fetching water. That was all. There were no footprints and no marks to cause anyone to suspect anything unusual. The canoe skirted the tree trunks and moved in alongside the water's edge. We pricked up our ears. A profound silence reigned the jungle. Saure and Ureta got out of the canoe and proceeded to comb their hair and adjust the feathers on their arrows. We unloaded food, utensils, and a sack full of presents. We moored the canoe and covered everything else with the terraplin. Before deciding to start off along the track, the warrior consulted each other and then conversed again and listened. Not a sound could be heard above the gentle murmur of the river. I began to doubt whether we really were at the entrance to the village. An emphatic ing yes convinced me. The Zavants never affirmed anything that was untrue. Two or three times Ureta went to the top of the high river bank and then came down again. Without further hesitation, I climbed the bank myself and looked along the track. The jungle engulfed everything around me, but the path must have been well-worn, for it was clearly marked, deeply imprinted in the center part. Lianas and creeping plants overhung it from the trees, forming a kind of tunnel which disappeared into the jungle. The whole thing might easily have been mistaken for an animal track. Ureta came up to me. He gave me a warning. P padi umi ondi, dangerous, don't carry arms. And cautiously he set off along the track. We followed him. Saure brought up the rear. To the white man with his characteristic gait of keeping the feet slightly apart, the going was extremely uncomfortable. We had to force our feet to conform to the narrow limits of the track made naturally by the Indians' way of walking. As a consequence of heavy loads they carry, particularly the women, they are somewhat bow-legged, which gives them greater and more effective support. We made our way through dead country, where the complete absence of any signs of life gave even the slightest sound importance. There was no song of birds, no cry of any animal, in spite of its narrowness, the path presented no obstacles. We never once had to stop or swerve aside to dodge a trunk or a branch. It had been made by tall men and women who bore on their shoulders veritable pinnacles of freight. The warriors carried part of their equipment for us, part of our equipment for us, but any movement in the bushes caused them to dump it on the ground. They did not mean their brothers to see them performing a menial task that was not appropriate to a warrior. Every now and then we paused to listen, holding our panting breath and trying to still the pounding of our hearts. Silence was the only response. The path curved gently. We left the low vegetation behind us and entered the forest. Nothing, not a living soul. On Ureta's back, scores of mosquitoes settled. He paid not the slightest heed to them. In treks through the heart of the jungle, I always redoubled my attention. 
to be ready for any attack from the wildlife. But this time my eyes were on the lookout, not for animal life, but for human beings. We were sitting we were a sitting target for any savant who had a mind to draw bow against us. Ureta's movements became slower. We waded across a large lagoon of blackish water, and as we climbed a slope, the warrior dropped the bales he was carrying. At the same moment, there reached our nostrils the smell of burning wood. As we topped the incline, I stopped. In a sort of half-moon formation, there lay ahead hundreds of little palm-leaf huts. They were dwellings which the Zavants used temporarily for their hunting camps. There was nobody in the village. The silence was the more impressive by contrast with the vigorous fluttering of flocks of vultures, which were searching for carrion and waste food. I breathed with a certain relief, and I believe Saure and Ureta did too. Although there was still an hour more before sunset, Norma set to work to go around settlement hut by hut, contravening for once the rules of the expedition, which stipulated that the first things we had to do were to get a meal ready and erect a shelter in which to spend the night. However, far from censoring her, I emulated her example with enthusiasm. Hollowed gourds of different sizes, broken and burnt, were scattered about where all the individual fires had been. Pieces of twine, a bow in good condition, palm fibers, and half-made baskets were the first booty we encountered. The falling shadows made it impossible to go on reconnoitering. When we rejoined the two Indians, they were busy roasting in a fire some green coconuts they had found in the huts. We tasted them that night, and they were not at all bad. We asked the Zavants where the tribe was, and Ureta pointed in the direction of the sinking sun, added that they must be in the parent village a long way off. We declined to make use of the native dwellings. At first we thought we should find them more comfortable, but the smell of smoke and the dampness daunted us. We preferred to leave them to the vultures dozing on the roofs, and we camped in the open air. We devoted one day to the study of the characteristics of the village. We discovered something of ethnological interest in the form of an earthenware pot. The primitiveness of and rough construction of which confirmed my theory that these avants belong to a group of nomadic hunters who principally have no use for earthenware but depend fanatically upon basket work. Back at the riverside, we distributed the equipment we were to take with us in our trek to the parent village and reinforced the protection of the canoe by covering the tarpaulin with a heap of sticks and stones. As we moved away from the humid land that ran alongside the river, we traversed a fine sandy soil for some distance, but wherever there were underground streams or pits and natural depressions, which still held water from the recent rains, the vegetation flourished with more strength and vigor than in the jungle itself. We traveled through deserts, marshes, and plains covered with thick grass that extended for mile after mile like a great sheet, relieved only by twining little bushes growing on small, cloddish elevations. Ure, Ta, and Saure walked effortlessly. They were content to be on terra firma. As for me, I was glad enough not to have to struggle with the canoe. Norma bore the ordeal of the trek very well, and the three of us adapted our pace to hers so as not to tire her out needlessly. As soon as it was light, each day we got up. We would breakfast on coffee and a handful of small coconuts and set off on the next stage of our journey towards the parent village. The warriors must have known the nature of these regions, for they never bothered to hunt anything, and indeed I never saw a single animal except a flock of screeching auroras.
We marched on in easy stages, generally when we stopped for lunch, we prepared to set up camp. This usually happened about one hour after midday. We had to replenish our reserves of energy, which the broiling sun obliged us to use up. Contrary to my expectations, this procedure met with the savant's approval. The equipment we now carried had been reduced to an alarming extent. Part of the already barely sufficient material had been left behind in Sare and Ureta's village, and half of what had been brought in the canoe we left there when we did not find the parent tribe in their hunting grounds. The lack of paraffin lamps, waterproof sheets, condensed milk, and many other essentials put us in a pretty bad plight. At night we were exposed to the climate and had to wrap up in our sleeping bags with our hammocks stretched overhead. By day the sun threatened sunstroke. The injuries to Norma's calf and to my feet got worse. The area of infection spread and attracted clouds of mosquitoes, which made the journey troublesome. If we tried covering the places with clothing or bandages, the friction made them even more painful. But in spite of this, our spirits were high. From these lands emanated a mystery that held us enthralled. The lack of nutritious food began to make its mark upon us. Yet we always began each day's hike with renewed enthusiasm, and not at all as though we regarded it as one stage more in a purgatory of hardships. On the fourth day, <clears throat> we glimpsed on the horizon a range of mountains. There must have been those of the Roncador, an odd name for it means the snore. Somewhere near it lay the legendary parent village of the Savants. The distance that separated us was as yet considerable, but the influence of that vision was to strengthen our resolve and uplift our spirits. The warriors too felt something for taking out of their bags their combs made of upright thorns fastened between two canes of bamboo. By a thread they combed their hair neatly and polished their weapons with a mixture of coconut oil so that they gleamed magnificently. Another day was coming to an end. We were marching confidently ahead towards the massive mountain range while filling the canteens with limpid water from a spring. Ureta, who was raising his hand to his lips to drink, was struck motionless. I looked around, expecting to see some animal, for it was days since we had eaten meat, and I failed to notice that the warrior had made no move to seize his bow. A fern parted suddenly, and the painted face of a Zavant warrior appeared. He examined us briefly, then uttering a piercing howl came up to us. He was carrying a bow and a handful of arrows, but had not assumed a belligerent attitude. Norma gave a cry of alarm, and voluntarily I found myself thinking of the Zavant's way of killing. One of them makes himself seen for a few seconds, and while his enemies are concentrating their attention upon him, other Zavants hit him behind bunches of palm leaves, approach, and smash the enemy's skull with their heavy spears. In response to the Indian's yell, the pass seemed to be filled with warriors, although actually there were only nine of them. With deliberate movements, I finished corking the canteen I had been filling and smiled at him. Norma smiled also, evincing an apparent calmness, which annoyed him, for he no longer looked at us. Ure Ta and Sao Rey were very far from being the proud warriors I had known. Shyly, they continued to stare at the water like children caught in some act of mischief. The captain said nothing. He turned round and faced us again, and the warriors who were accompanying him hemmed us inside a ring of spears. I gazed in the direction of the jungle, lacking the courage to look at any of the hunters individually, lest I should adopt a wrong and therefore provocative attitude. I glanced at the way the man in command regarded our two Indian companions. To my surprise, he dropped his haughtiness, and when he spoke to them, he did so almost shyly and in a murmur. In their exchange, there was no sign of either gladness or friendship. When the conversation ended, Ureta told me these were hunters returning to the village and that from here onwards we should be journeying with them. At an order from the captain, the hunters lowered their spears, 
I rather suspect with disinclination and demonstrated an insolent curiosity, I warned Norma not to overdo the smiling. Her changed attitude seemed to assuage them a little, for they now looked at each other satisfied at the effect they were producing. I certainly was in fear for our lives. The greatest act of prowess for new warriors was to kill, and if the victim of the killing was a white man, so much the better. Why not kill us who were intruders? If I had been one of them, one thigh hurled my lance to earn himself renown and prestige. In bundles of matting, they had a goodly quantity of fresh meat, especially venison, of which they offered Ureta and Saure a large hunk. Ureta was uncomfortable under the gaze of his brothers, who were watching his every movement. At length he held his head erect, and his body, which had seemed flaccid, suddenly recovered its former dignity as he came up to us and invited us to share the meat with him. We heard several tongue clickings as signs of disapproval, which we ignored. The warrior had become once more the renowned and valiant hunter of his tribe. The meat had been only lightly roasted and had still the odor of wild flesh. It cost a great effort of will on our part to swallow it, but we could not let Ureta down in this revelation of his friendship. As soon as we had finished, the captain struck the bales of our equipment with his foot and with an incisive toa. We started off once more, surrounded by the warriors. As a sign of hospitality, Saure and Ureta <coughs> were not allowed to carry anything, and although it assuredly did not please the other warriors at all, to have to carry anything of ours, they placed our equipment on their already heavy loads of game, and then arranged on top of it bundles of arrows wrapped in sleeping mats, with a bow, three arrows, and a spear in one hand, and steadying their burden with the other, they followed their captain, who with agile stride marched at the head of the column.